Welcome to We Believe, a consideration of religious beliefs and God's Word, examined in conversation by James F. Walsh, an attorney and Roman Catholic deacon, and Dr. Richard Shriver, United Methodist minister and professor of theology. Each discussion embraces carefully chosen subjects, selected in an effort to deepen your religious awareness in the sincere hope that We Believe will help provide a bridge of understanding among all the children of God. Jim, uh, welcome back. The first thing in my segment, and we're talking about baptism, is the first thing that I'd want to say is that the idea of infant baptism, which the Catholics uh, practice and teach and believe, and the idea uh, of sprinkling, mm -hmm. because it's kind of hard to think in terms of dunking a baby you yeah. know, in the immersion yeah. baptism. So the idea of sprinkling or pouring uh, and infant baptism is something that is a, an important uh, concept in most of the, of the Protestant traditions. Uh, well, let me interject one thing. I think maybe the sprinkling we'd have to, we don't sprinkle generally. Well, you know, what do you mean by sprinkling? Do you all take a pitcher and pour yeah, it over the head of the slow, child? Generally, yeah. It's, uh, okay. In, in our traditional way mm -hmm. in the Methodist Church, the minister dips his hand wow. into a sure. baptismal font and holds That's it fine. over the baby's head. You know, and different ministers use different amounts oh, of water. Oh, I see. You know. So it could, it could uh, come but, down. But no, thing. we don't use an use aerosol, an aerosol can. can. <laughs> <laughs> or turn on the shower. Oh, okay, I you got know. you. So it's no, just how much the, instead of using a little pitcher, you use his hand. Yeah, so right. Some, some preachers might have a bigger hand. And, you know, I think the idea of sprinkling is sort of a comical reference by Baptists who immerse. Oh, I see. To all of the rest of us who don't immerse. Oh, you, oh, you just sprinkle you. a little water over you. their head, you know. But, yeah, generally the pouring and sprinkling is basically the same right. idea. The idea that you do not immerse in water. And yeah. we're going to talk about that okay. in a minute. But that most Protestant groups, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, or Anglican, Church oh. of England, Methodist, and many of the other Protestant groups uh, have no disagreement with the Catholic notion of baptizing infants and doing it with a little bit of water rather than immersing right. the, the whole person in water. And part of that is because of the belief about what baptism is. In a minute I want to talk about the Baptist tradition, which is immersion, which has a different symbol. It's burying to sin becomes an important part of that idea. Uh, and it's adult baptism, you know, after repentance and being born again, or in some traditions uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit a spirit-filled Christian, or a born-again Christian, but an adult decision for Christ uh, as being the entry into baptism uh, in that tradition. You've got a little harder <coughs> job than I, but in this case, you've only got really two traditions. Uh, well, they vary in a lot of different yeah. little ways, but, yeah. but that's right. Uh, two basic traditions, the infant uh, sprinkling or pouring, or the adult uh, and immersion. Now, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do in this segment, uh, in addition to saying that many Protestants are in complete agreement on this with Catholics, they might not like to admit it. Mm, okay. <laughs> you know. Uh, but I wanted to offer a little bit of a defense. My tradition baptizes babies. I was baptized as a baby. You were baptized sure. as a baby. And uh, some want to say, oh, you were just christened, given a name. And I want to say, no, no. In the oldest Christian traditions, this has been done uh, to babies, uh, for babies. And that it's baptism, not just giving a name, christening, uh, really baptism. And I'd like to just tell a little story that, that to, to sort of illustrate how this got started, though it's not specific specifically in the New Testament, uh, in the Gospels. Um, 
I'd like for you to just think about the fact that Christianity entered into a, a pagan world of, of the Roman Empire. Of course, it started in Palestine where uh, a Jewish world, but it moved out into the pagan world. Imagine for a moment that you are a Roman citizen, a young man, and uh, you hear Paul preaching about the good news of Christ, and you're converted to Christianity, and you join this little group of Christians and become a part of the church. Mm -hmm. You're single, and uh, this beautiful little gal that you've had your eye on does the same thing. You don't know her, but you meet in this little Christian community, and you're worshiping regularly then on the first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection instead of the Jewish Sabbath on the seventh day of the week. Uh, and you meet, and you fall in love, Marcus and you marry. Marcus and Cecilia. Marcus and Cecilia. Go ahead. I've got the picture. <laughs> and you fall in love, and you marry, yeah. and you have a baby. Now, uh, she has the baby. Yes, I, I, I got that. You got that. I'm okay. with you. And what are you going to do? Let's say you're the first Christian couple in all history to get married and have a Christian baby out of a Christian union. Well, now, one thing is sure about the early church, whether you're Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or what, and that is that the sign, the initiation into Christianity was baptism. Sure. That, that uh, Jesus himself was baptized by John, the Jewish prophet, and that uh, that became the initiation rite, so to speak, for Christianity. And so, uh, what do you do? This first couple that has a Christian baby, may, you know, the product of a Christian union, it, it, it's obvious that they immediately wanted to baptize that baby, and they didn't dunk it under water. We don't even know how John the Baptist baptized. Do you know that? No, no. Well, we know is that he used the word baptize. We don't know what that meant. means to bathe, doesn't it? It has the two one. meanings. There are two meanings to the word baptize, and we don't know which one John meant because it's not in there to tell us. But one is to wash. You could do that in a shower or a tub. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, the other meaning of baptism is to dunk, and we don't know which he used. We don't know whether he pushed people under or whether he splashed them or whether he reached down with his hand and grabbed a bunch of water and poured it over their heads in a little shallow stream. We don't know. And the Bible is not specific on that. And it seems to me that the way we need as Christians to recognize that is by saying the way that it's important to you is valid. Now, those are my kind of two first stories. And uh, uh, I do want to tell a little bit about the Baptist tradition, but react. Yeah. Well, in all fairness, Richard, I think on this this particular subject, Methodists, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Presbyterians probably, would all run along the same channel, all practice infant baptism, and all really go back to the first century in that respect. Uh, we have very good written evidence in, as late as the, sec the second century that <clears throat> infant baptism was practiced. And also, there are three or four references actually in the New Testament that a family came in. I, oh, if you remember, do you remember the story of the, the jailer? St. Paul was put in jail, and there was a great earthquake. And then there was a, uh, the doors flew open, and the chains fell off all these prisoners. And the jailer was going to kill himself because... The prisoners, he thought, had escaped, and if he didn't do it himself, the Roman officials were, were going to take care of it. And Paul says, no, we're still here. Well, I think he was really impressed. Pretty nice he prisoners, was yeah. pretty impressed. And so he said, tell me, how can I be saved? What, what? And so uh, he was converted, and it says that that jailer and uh, also his whole family. Well, who's in a family? Usually their children, sometimes their children. There's another. Maybe even grandchildren. Maybe grandchildren. There's another thing, too, that I want to throw this in. This is somewhat off. There's another place where Paul goes to a certain city and he converts this lady who is a, a dealer in purple. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, th this is a complete aside, but, you know, most of those early Christians, I always imagine, kind of, were kind of poor folks. But, you know, 
the emperor wore purple. And the reason was that at that time, the only time you had, could get purple was from, some, I think, some shellfish that were very rare. And, and then that's, you made purple dye out of that. And Paul ran up. I uh, thought it was from Polk Salad. Berry. Well, yes, but Paul had run up on a rich lady, <laughs> you see, back to, Apparently, it's just kind of an amusing little incident. Yeah. But he had finally come on with uh, somebody who must have had some dollars in their jeans. You you better tell the other side of this. You better give the uh, the Baptist view of this. You, right you've here. left me about two minutes. Yes. To do well, that, I'm yeah. sorry. I do that to you. <laughs> and I'm not sure I know the point of the purple. Well, what I'm saying is, Paul finally ran into a rich lady that were go was going were going to help the early Christians because if he was selling purple. You were dealing with high Roman officials yeah. and probably making a lot of bucks. But and she had children too. I don't know, but her whole family <laughs> got to, her whole family. Whole, got baptized. Her whole family got yeah, baptized. Right. Well, that was the point. Yeah, that there are references to that's whole right. families. Okay, which would generally include children, wouldn't it? Sometimes. Uh, let me give a little of the Baptist tradition. In the time of at the time of the Reformation, really just a couple of years after Luther uh, broke with Rome and the Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformation began, uh, a man named Zwingli, following Luther's lead, organized uh, in Switzerland a group that became known as the Anabaptists. And uh, now they are known to us today more as the Mennonites and the Amish. Those are groups that came directly from this Swiss movement By in the 16th century. By Anabaptist would mean anti-infant Baptist, yeah, right? Yeah, that was where they, it was kind of a nickname. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, later than in the 16th, in the 17th century, in the early 17th century, the movement, uh, the influence of that movement, I think, got to involving people in England and, and a priest in England who denied his infant baptism and said, he rebaptized himself as an adult, and the Baptist movement, as we know it in America, was born in England. But uh, their argument uh, and that tradition is that baptism in the Bible, in the in the New Testament, is a thing that comes of, as I said a minute ago, a decision of an adult to choose Christ and to. Uh, uh, and, and the event is one that represents being born again and is an adult decision and that it requires immersion. Mm -hmm. Now, when we baptize an infant with pouring or sprinkling, we're talking about uh, the idea that God has entered into the life of that baby because it's a Christian baby, product mm -hmm. of a Christian uh, marriage. But... Uh, but the adult is the idea, the symbolism of water cleansing us of sin and water as a cleanser, uh, we become immersed to it hmm. and rise again sinless. A new person. A new person yeah. born again. And that's the Baptist tradition, and uh, it's an important one because many of the Protestant denominations come out of the Baptist tradition. I'm sure in the question period probably there will be some questions on that. Yeah, our time's up, so uh, we'll talk some more. Good. Today's We Believe program is brought to you by a grant from your local Knights of Columbus Council. Founded by Father Michael McGivney, the Knights of Columbus began when a few men gathered in a church hall in 1882. Today, the Knights of Columbus has a membership of over one and a half million men with local councils spanning the globe. The Knights of Columbus is a fraternal service order of Catholic men dedicated to providing support to the individual, the family, and the community. The principles of the order are charity, unity, fraternity, and patriotism. The Knights of Columbus truly surge with service. For more information, contact your local council or write We Believe, Post Office Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. That's We Believe, Post Office Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. Now, back to our program. There's been
been some very interesting discussion regarding baptism. And one of the questions that we have come across that we think is of particular interest is that you've both talked about various kinds of traditions of baptism and the different, you know, the amount of water and, and uh, falling down the well, even or throwing sure. them down the well in a kidding sense. Uh, but why can't all of the traditions be valid? Is there only one, or can they all be valid, or what? The feeling is that all of the traditions we've talked about are talking about truths that are important in their perspective for the totality of Christian faith, and not just on the subject of baptism, but I think that, I think that the Christian faith is like a patchwork quilt. And, and it, I think it would be a shame for one piece of the patchwork quilt to say, I'm the only piece of the quilt, or I'm the real one, or I'm the true one. Uh, I think we're best when we are together. And I think each of those pieces of the patchwork quilt, uh, and I teach comparative religion, and I teach comparative Christian denominations, and I enjoy looking at the Baptist church and saying, hey, you know, this is something you're really right about. And then looking at the churches of Christ or the Presbyterians and the Catholics, that's my feeling, right? that, that there is validity in, in all of these traditions. So it's like God is up there looking down at all the various ways that baptism uh, is enjoyed, plus other parts of religions, uh, of various religions, and he's saying, that's okay, that's Jim, okay, that's okay. Jim won't like this, but... Everybody <laughs> do it comfortably. But I, my, my reaction to that is, None of us, no one of us has the whole truth. Only God does. Well, now that you, he's put right. the question, why don't I give him the whole truth? <laughs> Do it. Well, I think in the Catholic tradition, and I thought Richard was going to argue with me a little bit about this, but I think the, one of the oldest, maybe the oldest, and the, the most expressive, the most symbolic is the immersion. In the sense that in, in Paul's writing, we die, the old man dies as he goes under the water. The new person arises from the water. Like the death of the old person, the sinful person, the, the arising of the new person. Don't you agree that symbolically that's... There's a marvelous drama about yeah. it, yes. And so I thought you'd remember that too, I guess. But I think the practicality of it, the baptism is a washing, or, uh, and we think pouring constitutes a washing, water running on the, the person's forehead. But now, I never really realized till today, Richard, that what I always thought sprinkling just meant, you know, like my wife sprinkles the clothes sometimes, you know. But actually, it just uh, it's more of a put down, isn't it? it yeah. But you know what? I was thinking on the way to the studio. Suppose this is the Catholic tradition now that would not, that would not uh, accept sprinkling. Mm -hmm. If there were a hundred soldiers going into battle, and they all wanted to be baptized at the same time, and you only had five minutes, I think the Catholic Church would accept sprinkling. You know, you could do what is practical and is what is real, and it's God acting, and he is using instrumentalities of human beings and, and things like water and bread, uh, but there's a common sense element to it. So that would be our view. And is a there a ceremony in the Catholic Church when... The priest. The Asperger's may. It's, a, it's reminding you of the that? Well, <laughs> it's where the priest walks down the aisle and has kind of a gold instrument kind of a thing, and he throws water on these people. And it's to remind you of a baptism. It's called Asperger's. That's Latin. You wouldn't know anything about that, Richard. Is it like a symbol? It's symbolic to remind you of your baptism. And that is really sprinkling. You just, you know. just a minute. How much Latin did you well, have? None that I remember. <laughs> none that I remember. Well, this Protestant took Latin for four years and well, learned very little. You could have it, yeah. <laughs> well, let's go to a different question that you know, is in the same framework. Uh, if a person is baptized, uh, are they baptized, I should say, uh, because of repentance in the situation where there is repentance, or does the actual act of baptism uh, <clears throat> uh, save them, him or her? Well, my reaction is that neither is the real truth. You were not saved because of baptism or because of repentance? No. If I turn that around on you? Yeah. I think that the thing is that God saves. 
And I think that his ability to save us, his, his desire to save us is always, surrounds us every moment of our lives. But he's also given us free will, and we use that free will to reject God, to turn away in so many ways. But that when we turn toward God, then God's salvation happens. And to me, the baptism, the ceremony, is simply saying this is something God is doing. And God is not dependent upon the ceremony. Uh, God does it when he can get into our hearts to do it. The water is symbolic of the, of the cleansing. Uh, the immersion is symbolic of the burying the sin. Uh, and it's more than a symbol. The ceremony is. You can see where my mind was going. Huh? Yeah, okay. yeah. It's more than a symbol, because it, but it does represent not something that we're doing, but something that God does when we allow it, because he's given us the free will for it. Now, I want to respond. I've had time to I'm think. I'm just relaxing. I'm going to respond this is to the that. first time I've done something yes. really heretical to the Catholic well, point of view. That's, <laughs> well, not no, you. Usually about once a program, you do something <laughs> heretical. No, really, I'm going to be nice to Richard. I'm usually not very nice to him. But he teaches comparative religion, and this is his, his area. And I want to ask him a question. Seriously, Richard. It's my impression that there are some religious traditions that say you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's when you are saved. And then the baptism is more or less when you join a particular church. Am I correct in that view? That is one of the Protestant traditions, yes. Is that more or less? Uh, a, a, and the baptism is done after, after the, the repentance sin. and the born again as a sign of the being born again. But, and you were going to... Well, I was going to say, you see, accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior is really another way to say, in a sense, baptism of desire. Yeah. But you see, baptism of desire is much broader because it's difficult to get the Buddhist monks into the acceptance of Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Into the, into the church That's for a right. baptism. Well, I mean, you can say of a Buddhist monk, he loves God, he tries to conform his will to God, and receives a baptism of desire, which in a, in a way for a Christian is accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it seems to me. Do you see what I mean? Uh, the, yeah. The, the, well, there are, other there. Yeah, there are other Protestant churches that believe that all of the repentance, the acceptance of Jesus Christ, which is sort of we're saying the uh -huh. same thing, are the preparation, and then the water actually is what actually it. brings the Spirit of God in and, and saves you. you and, uh, and, and, you know, that there's just that disagreement. And that's why I answered the way I did, that the really important thing is that God is the one doing it. Sure. It, I want to say that even in the Catholic Church, people are baptized before they're baptized. In giving adult instructions when a person comes to have explicit baptism of desire. I had, in, in working in this area, once gave instructions to a fellow. He was ready to, to be baptized, never been baptized, but he wanted to go home at some distance, some states away, but on the trip he died. But he's baptized. Yeah. He, had, he had explicit baptism of desire. Had he come back the next weekend, he would have gone through the ceremony. But I don't worry about that man, because he's got explicit baptism of desire. The, the monk, the Buddhist monk, has implicit. He's never heard of Jesus Christ. But what I was getting to is, I think in, that, in the Protestant tradition, there is one that says, no, it is the acceptance of Christ rather than the baptism. I just wanted to glean a little knowledge from my learned colleague. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that how far we can get with this next question, because I'm going to jump on you. Ask or, I'm, I'm going to ask the regular question I was going to ask, but I hope we have enough time for it. But what does baptism actually do for the soul? I can answer that. Jump it, right in. First of all, it brings a grace of sanctifying <coughs> grace into your, the vacuum, which is the soul, lost by the sin of Adam. And that it's done by God, so it doesn't that's, matter whether it's an infant or an adult. That's that would exactly be the Catholic right. point of view. Now, if it's an adult, all their sins are taken away, and all the punishment due to sin. And then it, it makes them able to receive the other seven, or the other one that you would have as a Protestant, uh, the other sacraments, fruitfully. 
that you cannot, if you're not baptized, you can't go out and receive communion and receive any spiritual grace from it. So that's the answer to your question. Thank you for asking a Catholic question. <laughs> well, then my right. answer to the question would be that John the Baptist uh, actually said, you know, I baptize with water, but one is coming after me who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And so the whole thing we're talking about seems to me, I think he, he got it right, that, that the whole thing we're talking about is that when baptism really happens, it's when God comes into the soul and cleanses the soul That's and right. makes you a new person. And uh, believe I thank you both very much for answering some questions uh, on this particular program, and uh, we hope that we're going to be back again. Right. We're delighted to have you with us, Pat. We hope your viewers will look in again soon. You have been watching We Believe, a discussion of God's Word and religious belief as presented by your host, Mr. Jim Walsh, a deacon in the Roman Catholic Church, and his guest, Dr. Richard Shriver, a United Methodist minister. Today's program has been brought to you by a grant from your local Knights of Columbus Council. The Knights of Columbus is a fraternal order of Catholic men dedicated to the service of God and neighbor. Last year alone, the Knights provided over $109 million and 55 million volunteer hours helping those in need. The Knights of Columbus truly surge with service. Deacon Walsh and Dr. Shriver would like to hear from you if you have questions you would like answered or topics you want discussed. Or if you would like a free booklet giving further information about the topics considered today, write We Believe, Post Office Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. That's We Believe, Post Office Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. Visit our website at www.webelieveshow.org. That's www.webelieveshow.org. Our email address is jimwalsh at webelieveshow.org. When you write, be sure to mention the number of the program. Today's program title is 844 Baptism Part 2. Thanks for watching. God bless you. We Believe is designed to promote better understanding among persons of different faiths. Deacon Walsh and Dr. Shriver have completed a series of 16 audio tapes providing a broad overview of the Christian religion. Deacon Walsh explains the teachings of the Catholic faith, and Dr. Shriver responds with a Protestant perspective. For information, write We Believe, P.O. Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205, or visit our website at webelieveshow.org.